is my pleasure to welcome you to Songs from the Forest tonight by Michael Obert. Um, often I think just a good place to start with these is to talk about your relationship with uh, Lewis and how the film started and really what, what the beginning of the project was for you. Yeah, in uh, autumn 2009 I was traveling in the area um, and I heard about this white man uh, coincidentally bumped into this story. Somebody told me a story about a white man who was said to be living in the deep rainforest uh, with hunter-gatherers, the Bayaka Pygmies, for decades, decades. So I said, wow, you know, you have to find this man. And uh, I was following um, two Bayaka, um, an elephant trail for maybe an hour or two, and then the vegetation opened up and I, I, I stepped in this clearing and uh, there's like loads, like 80, 100, 120, 150, Bayaka streaming towards me from all direction with their spears and their facial tattoos and their sharp and felt teeth and um, you know shouting at me and the, the pulling my shirt and I was paralyzed you know not out of fear but it's just like I felt uh, out of time it's, it's it felt really very very uh, old and intense and uh, all of a sudden uh, all the noise was cut off it was silent on the clearing, and uh, the Bayaka opened up, you know, two sides, and they built this little alley, and at the other end of the alley, there's this white man who comes out of the underbrush, you know? It was like a Hollywood movie or something. He comes out of the underbrush, bare belly, bare legs and feet. He has a, a Bayaka baby in each arm, and he comes through the alley towards me, you know, gives away the Bayaka babies to their moms, and he stands in front of me and basically he didn't say anything, he just stared me down. Uh, I felt very uncomfortable um, and uh, his expression was saying, uh, who, who are you and, and what do you want? And I just grabbed his hand, this moment was like by intuition, I just grabbed his hand and there we stood uh, two white men in the middle of the Congo Basin in this clearing, stared at by all the Bayaka shaking hands, you know, it was, and that was the moment, I think, when everything began, everything could happen in this moment, and uh, I think it clicked, two people, and it clicked between us, and that's 2009, uh, that's five years ago, exactly five years, and um, Louis is still one of uh, the most important people in my life, I think. The question is just, uh, when Lewis was in New York, he said that he was worried about the poachers, and um, someone was wondering if he helps keep them at bay while he's there. I mean, um, he, he cannot personally cope with hundreds or th maybe even thousands of poachers. They come from hundreds of kilometers, because this, this is one of the poorest areas in the world. And the rainforest is a you know fridge that is full, table is full, it's, meat, it's full of meat. So um, he, he can't, uh, it's not his job, I think. Um, but um, you're pointing out an, an important uh, aspect. I mean, the, the culture, the life, the traditional life of the Bayaka is under threat. I mean, the rainforest is cut down, poachers come in, you have the bushmeat mafia, the ivory mafia, you have uh, um, diseases that are brought from outside, like tuberculosis was mentioned in the movie. So um, Lewis is, uh, for a very, very long time, he's the only helping factor in the area, you know. And um, this is why, why we, the filmmakers, we uh, founded the Bayaka Support Project that you might have seen in the end credits. I want to tell you like a few words about this. Um, th the movie is something like a, a tool between our audience, uh, you and, and Lewis and his community. And um, you can directly um, help. You can go to our website, songfromtheforest.com. When you go home, all you have to do is, you know, run your computer, go on the website, you find a button, uh, help the Bayaka, and you can directly donate. So um, do it. You know, it's not important how much you donate, $10, $20. Important thing is that you go home and do it. And it goes directly to the Bayaka, to the community. Very difficult for me to say, because uh, whenever uh, Lewis or even we asked somebody, so how do you like it? Or what's going on? He said, don't ask me. <laughs> you know, 
I'm going to tell you when, when I want to tell you, but don't ask me. So he took everything in, and then they went back to the rainforest. They still live in the rainforest. But there's this little story that, that uh, Lewis told me um, when they were back, and we had the chance to communicate again. Uh, he told me that uh, when they came back in that very same white car, um, they stopped in, uh, near uh, Goma's house, the mother of Samadhi's house, and Goma ca came running out, and uh, you know she was screaming and crying, and, and, and she hugged both of them, and then she took Samadhi away uh, with her closest family. For more than four weeks, she disappeared with the boy in the rainforest. Not even Louis was part of this, of this um, trip. And uh, he told me, to my own surprise, that when, when they came back from the rainforest, Samadhi never, ever mentioned the trip to the US anymore. You know? He says he's sure that when, when, when um, Samadhi and his friends, they spend a night on a sandbank in the river fishing, that he's the great storyteller, you know, this great adventure, his experience. But um, in, in the house, in the family, etc., cetera, it, it, it almost seemed... Um, you know, over. So I found that very remarking, remarkable. Um, is it possible to access the archive that the uh, ethnomusicologist was talking about? And also, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the music that's actually in the film, yeah. and if yeah. uh, that was something that yeah. you worked on together. Yeah. So all the all the Bayaka music you heard in the film is taken from Lewis archive. So he has recorded a thousand four hundred plus hours. Uh, of beautiful music that we worked with in, in, in the film. And um, uh, the Oxford University's Pitt Rivers Museum is, um, you know, like taking care of the archive. And as the musicologist uh, described, uh, they di digitalized it. And a part of it is now, like if you, if you look for Oxford, uh, Oxford University, Pitt Rivers Museum, Louis Sarno, you will find part of the archive is already online. And you, you, you can listen to it. And as far as I know, like, uh, they, they, they want to uh, you know, make, make, make it accessible uh, throughout the world by more and more adding up to, to whatever they, um, whatever they can, ca can get online. So um, I also want to point out that uh, we have this beautiful uh, soundtrack. Um, we uh, didn't use the 16th century music for the soundtrack. We just used, we just focused on Lewis um, uh, recordings and added up like the pearls and gems of of, of his archive. So 60 minutes um, of beautiful, beautiful recordings, unique stuff. Um, it's I think uh, 15 euros. So I don't know how how many dollars it's here. Uh, we have some here. Um, you can buy them outside, I think, and um, you can find them online you know, a Green Recorder or through our website. And all the money, all the revenues go also directly to the uh, community. So we, we don't keep anything of this money. Um, so how long did it take for you to sort of earn the trust of the villagers? Yeah, I mean, I met Lewis in 2009. You know, this is my first movie. I, I'm a writer. So I'm coming from writing. Um, I went back and forth over two years without even having the idea that I would make a movie, you know? Um, so I went there, then I met Louis here, I met his family, I met his mother, then I went back to the rainforest, and then all of a sudden, maybe two years later, when we already knew each other quite well, the idea came up to make a film. So I think through this process of two years, um, um, you know, I know all the Bayaka by name. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, we have spent a lot of time together hunting in the rainforest, you know, on eye level, I would say. So when after two years, two and a half years later, I, I came with a little film team, just uh, me and three other people, um, it was just like, and you can see it in the, in, in the film, the, the, the Bayaka completely uh, relaxed and comfortable with us being there. And um, they just, they really wanted to give us something. Also, they realized that it was very important for Louis and they really wanted to give us something. It's a big gift, and I think we, we owe this movie to, um, to the Bayaka. How much is that a factor or influence on preserving that culture now? I mean, the Bayaka don't live an isolated life, you know? That's, uh, they are in touch with the outside world for many decades already, so you can see it in, in the film. It's, it's everywhere. Um, 
I, I am personally not a friend of this idea, okay, you know, we have this traditional lifestyle, hunter-gatherers, you know, you sh should stay in your forest and, and, and you know, live your traditional life, and uh, so we, we, we can go there and, and, and get some nice snaps and, and uh, live our romantic uh, uh, feelings. I think uh, uh, cultures are dynamic uh, structures and cultures change. They have always changed, they will change in the future, and uh, Bayaka's culture is no exception. Um, the, the, the tragical thing is that if we want to find, um, you know, um, elements of our culture that we have lost, we go to the library and just check it out. Um, the, the Bayaka's culture is a, an orally transmitted culture from generation to generation. There is no writing in this culture. So now when the old people die and the young people are no longer interested in learning what the old people would have to offer, then those things disappear, you know, forever. And that's the tragic thing. And I think there's uh, one of the values of Louis Sarno's um, recordings is that uh, maybe one day the Bayaka will not be able uh, to practice their traditional life anymore. Maybe the rainforest is not there for them anymore. Uh, one of my kind of ideas is that uh, Samadhi or his son or his grandson one day will discover uh, Louis Sarno's archive. And, uh, you know, uh, Bayaka don't uh, hear music. They hear much more in this music than we can detect in the music. And that they somehow have something that is conserved uh, that that defines their their cultural roots. Um, I know this didn't exactly answer your question, but I did my best. <laughs>